Okay. Um, if you want to turn to page 18 in your hymnals and follow along, you're welcome to. <laughs> I'd also like to call your attention to the things starting on page 20, the Con Langer's bookshelf that I put together. Uh, it's just a list of resources, books, movies, uh, games, uh, and just gives you an idea of some places you can find online used in popular culture. Should we salute them? I think so, yeah, exactly. Can you select in that general direction? Okay, I would like to thank, uh, um, I'd like to thank Cy and all the people who made the conference uh, possible and uh, give me the opportunity to come and talk to you all about my online work in progress. I'm neither a linguist nor do I play one on the internet. So, um, <laughs> I'm more than open to suggestions, critiques, and this is very much in the beginning stages. So, to, with no further ado, we'll move into the first slide. This is a language which is spoken by a race of sentient beings in my con world of Chris Land, which I came up with back in the early 80s. Um, played around with it for a while, put it in the back burner, and I don't know whether it was a midlife crisis or what, but I just recently took everything back out and sort of started working on it again, posting some things on the internet. And one of the sentient races is the, um, the Drushek. Um, I came up with their basic look and their um, name back in the early 80s. They stand about a meter tall, they have a mane of hair, they have long tails, and they get around most effectively by leaping great distances. The reason I'm bringing them up is I came up with the idea, and as David said, all, all conlangs start with some basic idea. I came up with the idea of, you know, I wonder if you could actually make a language that sounds like that little chipping noise that you do when you like imitate a chipmunk, you know, like that kind of thing. So I'm like, let's go for it, let's see what happens. And I also wanted to use a gestural component in this. So this um, idea led to, oh, and I wanted it to be a completely voiceless conlang, so there are no vowels per se, there are voiceless vowels, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and since it's uh, voiceless, I, want, I haven't decided whether it's technically because of biology or culture. If biological, it would be because the Drushek have no voicing apparatus like vocal cords or a syrinx or something like that. Or if it's cultural, it's because they value silence and stillness and see voicing as a harsh, inappropriate way to communicate. So from that idea, we came up with the following phonology. And feel free to laugh at some of these phonemes. Um, basic stops, P, T, and Q. Q it represents either a uvular or a velar uh, stop, and the stops are either final or usually followed by a fricative or a, um, a semi-vowel or pseudo-vowel. I'll show you in a second. The ejective series, this is where it starts to get a little weird. Um, these are unaspirated, and let me just run down through the pronunciation of them. Uh, and most of these can be pronounced even while you're breathing normally, so it's just the air, the passage in your, uh, in your throat that, that gives them. So we have. And. There you go. All right. The, the N is a nasal fricative, and the K ejective, the ejective K is a sort of a velar trill, but it's included in this series because it um, is a, a short, sharp pronunciation. Can you do the N again? <laughs> <laughs> Can you extend it? I don't know. I'll think about that. <laughs> the fricatives, um, they are... Uh, the F is, is, stands for bilabial, L is that lateral fricative, a Z is a palatal, and C is retroflex. So with those we have and semi-vowels. Probably a better name for these would be pseudo-vowels. These uh, can occur by themselves as continents, or they might show up in a word which has, uh, with, show up in a word where you'd expect a vowel to show up in, in a the voiced language. And the, the X is, of course, the, the, the CH in Bach. Um, the H is a pharyngeal fricative. And the R is sort of a, an extended version of that ejective R. So with these, you have a <sighs> and a purring sound that I love so much. <laughs> 
clicks. It has a series of clicks, and these are a uh, bilabial, a dental or alveolar, a palatal, and the K click is sort of the reverse of that objective K. So with these we have and oh, and by the way, if you noticed on the picture I had up there, the Druszek have very large ears, so it makes it easier for them to hear these quiet, uh, voiceless sounds. <laughs> and finally, I had to include a the velopharyngeal. This is the infamous double dot wide O of the speculative grammarian. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Uh, this is also the loudest sound in the phonology. And uh, my daughter and I were actually talking before I came here, so we decided that since the Druszek value, stillness, quiet, things like this, any word that has the velopharyngeal in it would be a, uh, a connotation of something negative or something bad. And this, of course, is pronounced. <laughs> well, let me remind you, this is not a joke. Line. <laughs> so, from this phonology, we get the following orthography. And the analogy I'd like to, to give you here is this is between um, uh, the, the two different ways to write the, cur the name of the current Dalai Lama. We have um, the first one represents the way that it's spelled in Tibetan, and the second one is pronunciation. I have two different ways, uh, two schemes of writing uh, the language. And the first is a more pronounceable uh, by humans. The where it, where it comes from within the Khan world is there's another race of beings that live near the Druzhek that have to pronounce their words. So that's how they get that. So we have Dritok, which is the name of the language. And this is the way that it would be the um, orthographically correct for um, in the way the Druzhek pronounces it. It literally means to share a, a better uh, translation of Dritok rather than language would be a communication system. And it's uh, sharing is literally what it means. It's because whenever you speak, you share you share what's in your head with someone outside of you. So you're sharing your thoughts with someone else. As you can see, this is written with the adjective R. Uh, the dots represent segments, there's a palatal click, the Z is asterisk, is the palatal click, the W represents a simultaneous rounding of the lips when you're doing the uh, palatal click. So this Dritok, if a Druzhek was pronouncing it, would be pronounced as opposed to if, oh well, we'll get that in a second, so. <laughs> the word Druzhek itself is, once again, we have that objective R, and the W, of course, is that rounding again. The second segment is a retroflex uh, fricative with a uvular stop at the end. So Druszek, as they would pronounce it, would be, no, excuse me, as opposed to the objective R at the beginning one, which was the, the normal pronunci the default pronunciation is uh, a widening of the lips. So without the W, you keep your lips apart whenever you pronounce the sound. Finally, a one last word. Shekstan is a mystical philosophy propounded by the Druzhek. This is a three-segment word. Uh, the colon in the last segment there is a relative lengthening. And this is, there's, there's no set length, but it is a relative lengthening within a conversation or within a um, recitation. You'd be able to tell that this, this was a longer time than the other. So this, this will be pronounced Okay, so but this is only half. This is only half the story. So we have gestures. There are ten basic um, ten basic handshakes. We have we have C, D, I, L, P. Q, U, V, W, and W. These are accompanied by five basic orientations. If we use the handshake D, you would have D1 is the palm facing the speaker, D2 is the palm facing out, three, four, and five, perpendicular to the ground. These are used basically to provide the context of the language. Uh, one of the Analogies, it's an imperfect analogy, but one of the analogies I'd like to draw between the gestures and the vocalizations is if, for instance, a sentence in Japanese, you have kan kanji representing words and kana representing like particles and prepositions and things like that. And I don't know Japanese, but bear with me here. Um, so, what I would 
the analogy I would make is the vocalizations would be used for the kanji, the gestures would be used for the kana. So you would have with 10 hand shapes, 5 orientations, you get 50 basic gestures. So syntax, we have, of course, the word <laughs> Now I would have uh, Q1, this would be a, this is a first person, first person singular gesture, so it can mean I, my, me, whatever in, in, in the context. Um, if we attach, the gestures are attached to the vocalizations with an equal sign. So if we do this, we do do that would mean I am a through check. Now, if you want to, the ampersand is a motion attached to that gesture, so the ampersand represents a circling gesture, so anytime you see an ampersand connected to a gesture, that means that it's, uh, it circles, uh, Q1 just happens to circle out and back. So if you would do like that, that would be we are all through check, but since we're not, you would negate the entire sentence by the negative particle there at the end. Yeah, that both has the colon and the W, so you round the lips and you lengthen the, uh, the sound. Finally, we get something that looks like this. Um, starts to look like a mathematical equation after a while. But if we break this down, of course we have the word for the, uh, the language itself, which is We have P5, which is uh, either a dative or beneficiary of, of, a, of a phrase, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, P was this, 5 is the perpendicular to the ground, so as you pronounce the vocalization, you would do Finally, we have the Q1 again, uh, and this would be pronounced, and I've been practicing this for the last several days, and I still can't get around. is the last, is, which means speak literally, it means to give form with the mouth. So if you would make the Q1 gesture with the circling motion, saying the same, saying at the same time, that would be we are speaking. So all together, you say we are speaking Dritok with the Drushek, and literally we are giving form with our mouths to a communication system with the Drushek. So all together this would be, okay, hold <laughs> Okay. And so, Phonetic alphabet. 
the SLIPA is what, the, what that stands for. And that I actually got a few ideas from, from that. I at least said, okay, well, I'm basically on the right track. So if David did it, it must be okay. <laughs> We have a rather large uh, nasal cavity there, so you can really get some uh, volume going with the bellopharyngeal. Uh, <laughs> so I think that would that would probably be what, because since since it wouldn't con connote danger or something bad that if, if you were trying to you know yell to somebody, um, and that also brings up a point. Like I said, I'm not I haven't decided yet whether it's actually biological or cultural. If it's cultural, I mean they could you know make allowances for you know hey watch out for that cliff. You know that kind of thing, but if it's if it's actually that they have no voicing apparatus biologically, then that would preclude them. You know, like I said, technically it's every everybody for themselves. Um, Popolani from the IRC forum has a question: Where do you practice your comedy? <laughs> <laughs> All alone in a quiet room, away <laughs> from my family. No, I, I and this is actually this has only grown up probably within the last six months or so. So this is this is all still fairly new. So yeah. Okay. Um, David. Yeah. Where's that mic? Yeah. I, I gave you kudos, David. So be, be kind. <laughs> <laughs> Am I hearable? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. This is the worst language I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm kidding. All right, uh, I think I got a, a question and a, and a comment. All right, okay, first, okay, the, the comment that um, with, uh, with uh, Jeff Simers often, it's like the person is not facing you and you need to get their attention. Another way that you can do it is with, of course, vibration. So if you wanted to shout, you know, maybe you could, um, you know, if there was a tree nearby, you could wrestle a leaf or something or do something so that vibration convey the sense that you know turn around and look at me or something so that you know, we can uh, we communicate or you know look out anything like that that's that's actually a good point with, with, with stomping on the floor i mean if these guys are able to leap and they have the, the muscular legs and doing you know, the old thumper on you know bambi you know that might be a possibility <laughs> right and, but, uh, and i assume they don't wear shoes or anything uh, no, you make that decision right now. No, they don't. <laughs> well, there you go. Oh, extra, sense, extra sensitive. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Another question I had was, so I see this, this dude here has an earring. This is male? Yes. Yeah, well, actually, they're, they, they, they're, they have no gender. They are, they are parthenogenic from what, they, as far as their reproduction and stuff goes. So. Okay, well, according to linguistic universals, then that means it's male, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay. So the one thing I noticed is the earring. So is that uh, is that why the possibility they they make stuff like? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Well then, it is conceivable then that they could create some sort of a symbolic system like an orthography. Yes. Yes. Do you, do you have one or have you thought? About I'm it? considering. I'm trying to come up with, you know, how, because I'd have to come up with two separate things, basically, one to represent gestures and one to represent the vocalizations. So you have basically, that whole kanji kana sort of 
dichotomy? Well, it depends what your symbols were. It doesn't necessarily mean to be writing. It could be something that was constructed. Oh. And if it's an object in the real world, then it can be turned in various ways. Or well, connected in various ways. Anyway. Please continue. <laughs> somebody else who's going to see it later, there's any number of things that you could possibly do, and it's yeah, I think it'd be an awesome project. Cool. So, yeah. Excellent. In medieval, uh, there was a medieval memory technique where they would like use arrangements of birds to spell out messages. Oh, they were off of real birds? Well, there were paintings of birds, but you probably do it with live birds. <laughs> <laughs> Trained <laughs> parents, <laughs> yes. <laughs> suggests that you could have another um, sign, namely throwing rocks. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you guys are getting rocks. Small, small Depending on you know, how pissed you are, churches will, will, yes. will, de will define how hard you throw That's a rock or nice. where you throw it at. <laughs> that, there's also that tail aspect. I haven't worked for how to, how to figure the tails into uh, the the language yet, but so that's that's a, that's a possibility too. Uh, Kelly's question about yelling made me realize that there's another vocal uh, uh, something you could do that that <laughs> whistling. Oh yes, so it doesn't yeah. require a vocal cord. That's yet you can get a lot of volume with it. That's true, and and also I mean you wouldn't have to necessarily use it as a component of the the language, uh, a meaningful. It could be a person of interjections. Be, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Attention getter, or yeah. a vocative particle, or something like that. <laughs> that's, that's a very good point, yeah. Okay, um, cool question. Do the um, Name gestures. Oh, what? Name since you haven't spoken yet. Oh, hi, I'm Yuri. I'm a Berkeley student here. Anyway, um, so, cool question. Do the gestures have names in the language? And if they do, can those names be used instead of the gesture, for example, if you have an amputee, for example? <laughs> oh, good question. Ouch. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to think about that one. That's going to leave a mark. <laughs> That's a very good question. Most of the, most of the gestures, there, there are two-handed gestures. You can, you, for instance, if you had, if you did like like something like something like this, you would uh, first of all put the the. This would be. Let me think. This would be D. D four and then Q one. You put D four slash Q one, so you can have you can have two handed gestures too. But most of the ones you could probably get away with just using one hand. So if you did have a two handed gesture, you could sort of you know like have if it was an amputee, you could stick a stump. You know at least that would that look like a fist. <laughs> but uh, that's a very good question. That's or they could just have speech impediment. Yeah, speech impediment. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, props are required. For them. Props are required. Exactly. <laughs> Facial sign language. There you go. Um, does anyone else have a question? And, okay, in that case, thank you very Great. much. Great, thank you very much.